Hi, everyone. Hello. Hi, how are you? I'm all right, thank you. How are you? Doing all right, thanks. Probably. Are you all in? Oh, okay. <laughs> so trying to get my, there we go. Yeah, that's what I was open to. I was just going to ask that. So, all right, okay, here we go. The heart of the perfection of the Wisdom Sutra. I prostrate to the Arya Triple Gem. Thus did I hear at one time the Bhagavan was dwelling in the massive vultures mountain on Rajariya, together with a great community of monks and a great community of bodhisattvas. At that time, the Bhagavan was absorbed in the concentration on the categories of phenomena called profound perception. Also at that time, the Bodhisattva, Mahasattva, Arya, Avalokiteshvara looked upon the very practice of the profound perfection of wisdom and beheld those five aggregates also as empty of inherent nature. Then, through the power of the Buddha, the Venerable Shariputra said this to the Bodhisattva, Mahasattva, Arya, Avalokiteshvara, how should any son of the lineage train who wishes to practice the activity of the profound perfection of wisdom? He said that, and the Bodhisattva, Mahasattva, Arya Avalokiteshvara, said this to the Venerable Shariputra, Shariputra, 
any son of the lineage or daughter of the lineage who wishes to practice the activity of the profound perfection of wisdom should look upon it like this, correctly and repeatedly beholding those five aggregates also as empty of inherent nature. Form is empty, emptiness is form, emptiness is not other than form, form is also not other than emptiness. In the same way, feeling, discrimination, compositional factors, and consciousness are empty. Shariputra, likewise, all phenomena are emptiness, without characteristic, unproduced, unceased, stainless, not without stain, not deficient, not fulfilled. Shariputra, therefore, in emptiness, there is no form, no feeling, no discrimination, no compositional factors, no consciousness, no eye, no ear, no nose, no tongue, no body, no mind, no visual form, no sound, no odor, no taste, no object of touch, and no phenomenon. There is no eye element, and so on, up to and including no mind element, and no mental consciousness element. There is no ignorance, no extinction of ignorance, and so on, and up to and including no aging and death, and no extinction of aging and death. Similarly, there is no suffering, origination, cessation, and path. There is no exalted wisdom, no attainment, and also no non-attainment. Shariputra, therefore, because there is no attainment, bodhisattvas rely on and dwell in the perfection of wisdom, the mind without obscuration and without fear. Having completely passed beyond there, they reach the end point of nirvana. All the Buddhas who dwell in the three times also manifestly completely awaken to unsurpassable, perfect, complete enlightenment and reliance on the perfection of wisdom. <clears throat> Therefore, the mantra of the perfection of wisdom, the mantra of great knowledge, the unsurpassed mantra, the mantra equal to the unequaled, the mantra that thoroughly pacifies all suffering should be known as the truth, since it is not false. The mantra of the perfection of wisdom is declared tayata gate gate paragate parsamate bodhisattva. Shariputra, the Bodhisattva, Mahasattva, should train in the profound perfection of wisdom like that. Then the Bhagavan arose from that concentration and commended the Bodhisattva, Mahasattva, Arya Avalokiteshvara, saying, Well said, well said, son of the lineage. It is like that, it is like that. One should practice the profound perfection of wisdom just as you have indicated, even the Tathagatas rejoice. The Bhagavan, having thus spoken, the Venerable Sharidaviputra, the Bodhisattva, Mahasattva, Arya, Avalokiteshvara, those surrounding in their entirety, along with the world of gods, humans, Asuras, and Gandharvas, were overjoyed and highly praised as spoken by the Bhagavan. Great. Press to turn the wheel. To fulfill the needs of all beings at their various levels of understanding, we request that you turn the wheel of Dharma, including the lesser and greater, common and extraordinary. Okay, starting a uh, few minutes of shamatha, getting a little feedback here.
Then we're virtual. That's good enough. Okay, let's let's see if people can hear me in video land. JD saying yes, Ellen saying yes, okay, George saying yes. A little feedback. <clears throat> The, the Buddha uh, claimed to have discovered some truths. So these are like normative truths, truths of how they are for everybody. So his first teaching historically uh, is uh, turning the wheel and talking about the Four Noble Truths. So our goal, if we accept the path of Buddha Dharma is to explore these truths, make them true for ourselves, and uh, to be the truth, to be awake, to be a Buddha. In a very relative culture, uh, you know, it, it can sound fairly um, strange to say these, these are some truths about your life, existence, and suffering, um, instead of just saying, well, this is my, my truth and you can have yours, <laughs> or um, this is maybe, or this is a probability, because a lot of uh, things are probabilities, like scientific truths, uh, which are still very important. But the Buddha said, no, I've discovered some truths with capital T, and they all can go under truths. So uh, sometimes when uh, I give refuge or talk to people in the interview in Darshan, I say, well, what's, what's the uh, real refuge? Because of course we sing the refuge formula, the refuge to Allah, the refuge to the Buddha, the refuge to the Dharma and Sangha. So in our tradition, it's uh, the refuge <clears throat> and different uh, traditions, different Dharma traditions, um, teachers might uh, say different things. Um, but uh, in our tradition, we would generally say the Dharma, the truth. So it has to be the truth. Um, some Dharma traditions believe that. Um, the Buddha appointed uh, a direct successor. Um, Zen tradition sometimes says, oh, the direct successor was Mahakashipa, and then we go from there. Things, um, Zen koan about how the Buddha held up a flower and said nothing, and then Kashipa smiled, and the Buddha said, um, you know, my, my dharma I transmit to you. Um, this may have been the case, or it may have been something that um, one of the Zen groups um, used as a way to legitimize lineage. But um, it is also very possible, and we have some record that um, as the Buddha was uh, dying, of course that was a big issue. So he said, well, um, the, the dharma is your refuge, right? <clears throat> 
Although there, there were, at the time, what were considered Arya Sangha, in other words, uh, men and women who had uh, realized the truth. But uh, the refuge is uh, the, the Dharma. Yeah. So our point uh, here is that we're practicing to um, have experience and insights and certainty of these truths. Not to come up with necessarily an alternate truth, although uh, if you can prove it, we'll be interested but, uh, to embody and realize the truth, the Dharma. So sometimes when people say uh, Buddhahood or enlightenment, it sounds very vague, like, um, or maybe it doesn't sound vague, maybe it sounds like some very good experience you've had. <laughs> Or some experience, but an experience by itself um, in our tradition is not necessarily self-validating. It has to be tested. And this was particularly the case in India. There were many experienced yogis in India, logicians and um, people that were smart, and they didn't necessarily, even at the time of the Buddha, accept the Buddha said, so he had a lot of dialogue. And people, some people became the students and some people didn't. <clears throat> and as Buddha Dharma progressed in India, it, it grew uh, with patronage from uh, Rajas and patronage from local people and uh, they built monasteries and temples, but along with um, the growth uh, became, uh, you know, there was competition, right? It's only so much um, support, a kingdom or <laughs> kingdom or any kind, you know, it's like they're supporting Brahmanic temples and they're supporting Buddhist temples, like um, at some point, uh, Groups are going to vie for patronage, right? And the Rajas are going to decide, oh, well, we're tired of you guys arguing and everyone asking me for money, so I'm going to have a debate. So you're a member of um, royally respons uh, sponsored debates in India. In fact, um, one of the major debates um, that was recorded in Tibet were um, some many debates mostly between um, the representatives like Kamala Shila from the Tibetan side and a, a mysterious Mahayana monk from the Chinese side. And, um, maybe the victors write the history, but um, it was decided that the uh, Indian approach to Dharma would be the dominant one in Tibet. Um, so since that day, more than a thousand years ago, that's been the case. <clears throat> so even during the time of the Buddha, um, the Dharma, the truth, had to be um, justified. So it isn't uh, just uh, a question of saying, I know this to be true, please accept it or I know this to be true, and it'd be better if you did, or I know this to be true, and you'd be sorry if you didn't. But uh, in India at the time, we're very lucky that people had to um, be convinced without immediately jumping to, um, well, if you had the same experiences that I had, you'd agree with me. Because I know we don't always have the same experiences as other people. So, uh, and we may not want to go through the steps to have the kind of experience they claim is revelatory and truthful, but we can have a discussion. And if it makes sense, then we might be willing to do it. So a big part of Buddha Dharma was dialoguing with people that didn't have you couldn't say, well, I'm having the same realization as you, so uh, I agree. 
but having dialogues with people that had a lot of different views and different experiences. In India, for a long time, it wasn't necessary to uh, formalize uh, our style of debate or our, our style of epistemology or how we know what we know. Um, but, uh, because of competition, perhaps, or uh, because of certain key people like uh, Dignaga and Dharmakirti and the Buddhists in India evolved a way to uh, justify and explain and defend uh, Buddhist truths to people that not only weren't doing the same kind of practices, but might even be hostile to the practice. So uh, for our purposes here in Sacramento, um, I've asked people to start reading along these lines because um, if you think it's hard to explain to our Sangha members what our experience is and what we think they should be doing or acting, how much more difficult it is to explain and justify and advocate to others who don't necessarily want to start meditating first or go through all the trainings or accept anything at all on uh, belief or faith. So for each one of us listening here today, like uh, when you're talking with people and you are trying to um, have them see certain truths, uh, how successful are you? <laughs> like if somebody, you know, for some key discussions that are happening today around the pandemic, uh, if someone is uh, totally on the opposite side, how successful are you with the dialogue with them? Um, if you're just talking about um, meditation and somebody's not a meditator and you think it's great, how successful are you explaining why they should be doing it if uh, they don't have the motivation or even if they've had um, maybe a negative experience, right? Or if you're talking to somebody who's well trained, they're saying, well, you have to explain to me how you, what is mindfulness? What is realization? What is bodhicitta? How, you know, how does it work? I don't, want to, I don't want to start doing something before I know how it works. If you don't know how it works, uh, I'm not going to um, get them to follow through. I've had a few friends that have been in car sales. And, um, <laughs> I guess they're different kinds of people. You know, uh, some people are totally, you know, they just I want transportation A to B, so I just want to know um, it won't break down. And some people just want to know that they can drive fast. <laughs> uh, so they might, they may, or some people might look and the car looks great and it's comfortable. But there, there are a few people that actually maybe know something, so they're interested in all the specifications, right? <clears throat> like, how do you know that? Or show me the data, right? Show me the data. You know, what are the test results? I want to read you know, your crash test dummy results for this car. And you might say, well, this is really safe, but you know, okay, well, that's great. Where's the evidence? So, uh, reading Dharma Kirti uh, is like Dharma Kirti was uh, a practitioner who says, Well, okay, I'm willing, based on ordinary consciousness, uh, give you the evidence that um, our style of yoga makes sense. Here's, here's how we know what we know. <clears throat> So uh, some of us aren't particularly interested in that if you're kind of like, well, this works for me. I'm really not interested in dialoguing or um, talking or convincing anybody to do yoga with me or that it would be better for them. So why should I be reading or studying 
um, these texts? Well, um, because I believe that it would be benefit, even if you never talk to anybody again, because you have a big doubter inside your head already. And going, yeah, I don't know. Maybe. In fact, they're not open, so, you know. So I know that most people are in conflict with themselves, not just moral conflict or emotional conflict, but in cognitive conflict. Say so you know something, but then you know doubts. So uh, usually uh, the biggest person, the biggest problem person we have to work with is ourselves. And that we're not really certain until we are convinced ourselves uh, how we know what we know. Just sitting in shamatha, uh, which is absolutely essential to have a calm and clear and balanced awareness, uh, won't resolve uh, doubts about how we know what we know. Um, just um, investigating and having an experience of uh, the nature of mind or self or phenomena um, by itself won't tell you how you know what you know. Many, many people have wonderful experiences and insights and uh, gain some truths from that. They repeat the insights, they finally see some truths, but they can't explain it to others. They can't explain how they got there. There are many talented people, like, but they're not they're not good teachers. They might be good musicians or like, good attorneys or good lawyers, but um, there's something different. There's something special that makes people uh, good teachers. They, and uh, I'm always interested in that myself. So even if you have a totally um, cooperative audience, there's still going to be doubts. People aren't going to know how they know what they know, how they got there. So, Dhammakirti and Nyaga and many of the uh, acharyas that we've been reading have been interested in how do we teach Dharma, not just to ourselves, but to people that are not interested or maybe even hostile, which of course is ourselves most of the time. One of the persons that took the teaching metaphor uh, very seriously um, started a uh, whole lineage um, in Tibet, um, and that was uh, Atisha, who uh, came from the uh, Karma Shila and uh, was especially um, connected with Tara. <coughs> Tisha I was very old, and uh, the present the king in Tibet was um, wanting to reestablish some uniformity among the arguing uh, Buddhist communities at the time, particularly after the persecutions of the last 200 years. I can really relate to that. I, I would like to um, start in uniformity and harmony in Dargay. <laughs> with all the different <laughs> opinions, dharma opinions. Um, so uh, uh, he sent for um, uh, a scholar and practitioner in Yogi, and uh, they said, oh, that's a Tisha even Karash or Jana, and uh, a Tisha didn't want to go at first. He was like, maybe my age, you know, schlepping up mountains with a bunch of barbarian kind of blood drinking Tibetans. But um, Tara um, inspired him and said, you know, you will benefit many people, but your life will be shorter. I wonder how many people would really do that nowadays. You know, it's like, it's, well, you know, you should go to some you know, difficult place that was full of 
thing. Hey, you know, you should go here where this wheelchair fighting and it'll really be a benefit that your life will be shorter by about 15 years. Would you do it? I think twice, wouldn't you? And on top of that, you have to walk there. <laughs> so. <laughs> okay. But Atisha was one of the first uh, people to um, realize, okay, things, there's lots of Dharma in Tibet, but it's not organized. And he effectively wrote the first Lama, which stages the path. And uh, those are called the, uh, you know, Vrnipatha Padita, so light on the path. And then he uh, gave a teaching on a long time ago. And then of course he did the Lama Kramas, right? And stages of meditation. <laughs> And Atisha's work uh, inspired Don Tapa, his um, student, who was actually a householder. And uh, uh, the Kadapa tradition was born, where there was an emphasis on simplicity and dialogue. <clears throat> and uh, what we know now is Lojong practice. The, uh, you know, skipping ahead, like, couple hundred years, the, the person that really was inspired by Atisha and decided to uh, put the majority of his time into teaching was who? Don Kappa. And so, okay, I'm not just going to be a yogi and transmit uh, to just a few people. I'm going to do a lot of writing. I don't know how he did it, first of all. Like, it is amazing. I mean, all the meditation he did all the administration, which is exhausting and time consuming, by the way. And then, you know, all the writing, you're writing with a little a pen that you dip in the ink and then scratch. Yeah, and then scratch. <clears throat> so a big emphasis in our tradition is like, uh, not just have your own personal realization or be charismatic, but um, are you able to explain uh, in, in a real teaching method how it works? So that's why I'm fond of saying uh, all from the Buddha, the Buddhists do not cure by laying out of hands, do not wipe away sins with water, do not transfer realizations, but teach. So I want this to be a teaching in Sandra so that we not only give accurate information, but are able to help ourselves by dealing with our own doubts. Because in our tradition, we're not skeptics. We want to come to certain, we want to eliminate doubts. <clears throat> There's some uh, um, people that I haven't seen before, um, and I, I want to say hello to them. If this is your first time and you've uh, tuned in, um, uh, I may not be meeting your needs because uh, this isn't a talk how to be a nice person or just how to be a better person, but how do we know things and how do we uh, teach them to others? So in our tradition, it's perfectly valid for a person to raise their hand and go, well, how do you know that? So you just don't propose it or just claim it. But how do you know that? And you know, also ask for someone's, you know, CV. Like, well, who do you study with? And <laughs> you know, it's like even though we like your arguments, we also want to know, like, what are your credentials? So um, we're uh, we're very willing to you know, share those. And of course, it takes, uh, culminates in uh, you know, tantric impairment where we don't want you practicing this style of yoga unless you personally have been authorized to do so. Like that, right? So it doesn't just you know the arguments for doing it and it makes sense to you, but you also have to have personal permission. <clears throat> so I, I, I don't know if. Some of the newcomers want to speak up and uh, ask questions or make comments, but I want to pause here. 
to see if that's on um, or the locals sitting here tonight who have a comment or a question or a complaint. Yeah, you need the microphone. I'm not going to give you mine. Yeah, so. Um, Matt, my husband was at a birthday party for our kid. Hmm. Um, Sunday, I guess. Hmm. Uh, and I sent me a couple of really interesting our and one of us came to dinner with her. That's it. Uh, the best thing that is in our tradition is um, to set out a situation where someone uh, with you is willing to have a dialogue. Uh, the sutras and indeed the tantras are in form of dialogues, somewhat like platonic dialogues, you know, Plato and Socrates and all that. Um, because the understanding is through dialogue and exchange that um, people arrive at the truth. So even though we may arrive at some truths sitting in our cushion at home or in the cave, uh, it, it's still necessary to have a dialogue, right? So you, know, you can start out by saying something that you, you believe to be true and then ask if that's true for them. Or you, you can say, well, what's true for you? Um, or you know, why are you interested? So sometimes uh, in teaching style, you can um, ask for their motivation, right? You know, what brings you here? <clears throat> um, uh, that's, that's a traditional kind of therapist joke, you know, like, what brings you here? And the, and the patient says, the bus. So that's called concrete operations in Piaget, right? So, uh, but, you know, starting off by asking a question of someone is, is one way of teaching, right? What, what do you want to know? Or what, what, what kind of problems are you encountering? But another style is to make an assertion. You know, we're, we're all kind of stressed out here. You know, following up by a question, we're all suffering. You know? <laughs> or, you know, are you, are you interested in um, finding a way out of suffering? <clears throat> Sometimes uh, the Buddha you know, started one way like that, or start out by a certain truth, sometimes started with what's, you know, what kind of problems do you have? Um, you know, sometimes the Buddha would just start out with, here's stuff you shouldn't be doing, <laughs> also, right? That's a provocative way of teaching, isn't it? Like, um, you're, you're just going around, like, accepting an invitation at someone's palace or fortress and then um, eating their food and then just kind of saying, you know, I hear you've been killing a lot of people lately. <laughs> How do you think that's going to end up for you, right? So <laughs> you're, you're, you know, talking about karma or something like that. So um, there are uh, different teaching styles like that, right? one of the most difficult to master is when you have somebody who's uh, you know, not, who's relatively intelligent and um, if you're making assertions about uh, the nature of awareness or truths that can only be um, accessed through um, introspective means, right, then uh, you know, you're going to be asked to justify it. Um, whether or not in, in the West, um, introspective um, exploration um, really started 
uh, fading uh, with the rise of modern science and you know, modern psychology, right? which in a way is you know, kind of, I would say, post Freud, right? Because Freud just saw a few people and wrote these long books, right? And with no, with no evidence based, right? How do you know there's an end and sought and you know you know significant statistical relevant uh, statistically significant number of patients I saw them you know? so I don't have that from Floyd but um, when you get people that are looking for the evidence then uh, it's extremely important that uh, you know, be able to provide that. Uh, that was the situation in India. Um, there were, there were rival logics and uh, rival yoga groups, right? Uh, you know, I, I think you get in a trap sometimes if you start out being an expert, you know? Comfort and Shea, who I studied with in the 70s, um, was very good at using uh, uh, me. We're in the same boat, you know, so we're all experiencing uh, that no more. We're all kind of, so uh, a very inclusive style, and in a way that was probably the, the Buddhist original style, too, like we're all suffering. We all want to be free from, you know, we all experience, you know, we want to be free from suffering. So the Dalai Lama talks a lot that way too. Like, does anybody deny that they want to be free of suffering? So we're getting more enlightened here. Yeah, okay, good. Um, does that help? Um, virtual land. Can you see me better now? Yeah, George is going, no way. So JD is going, maybe. Karen's going, now what? Okay. <laughs> Lama, are you hearing questions? Lama, are you hearing questions? How do we know things? What? What, what do you mean by how? I don't understand. <clears throat> well, if we say we hear a sound, uh, what exactly are we saying? So we can. Uh, we can like notice that there's a difference maybe between hearing and listening. I would say I could I could I could uh, hear people talking, but I really wasn't listening. So what uh, or um, how is it that we actually you know like hearing works? So this is not just a question for Buddha Dharma, but for physiology and you know, psychology. But, um, you know, do, uh, do sound waves, you know, how do sound waves work, and how does the ear work, and how does that translate, um, how does the brain work, right? So um, this was, these are Abhidharma kinds of questions and uh, epistemological questions that uh, uh, this over the ages have wanted to work with because um, the conclusions we draw even about something as simple as hearing uh, have lasting results about how we understand who we are and how to be free. Usually we think of sound as coming from the outside and there's a person that hears it, right? We usually we use just common language saying you know, I, I heard a sound outside. Could you go check and see what it is, right? That kind of thing. But uh, there's a problem with uh, uh, ordinary language when we, an ordinary way of talking like that, if we really try to um, break it down and see if it exists um, objectively, right? Uh, one of the biggest problems 
we have in this country is just when, or maybe even the time in India, when people would say, I just know it to be true. I just know it. I don't have to get vaccinated. I just know it. Or there is God, I just know it. Or there isn't God. Or this suffering, I just know it. So uh, perception and knowing can be broken down into parts, which demonstrates from our side that things are interdependent. Right? But it also allows us to find out where does misknowledge happen so that we're not making claims about things that um, become you know, fixed or absolute. One of the biggest problems in knowledge and in yoga is, um, what, you know, why if it all works so great, are we still ignorant? Why do we make mistakes? So why do we sometimes hear a sound and we think it's uh, a child crying, but it's just our cat? So how do we how do we distinguish between what's uh, a truth and an untruth? So if you don't know how you arrive at the truth, you're not going to understand how it is that you make mistakes. So by breaking things down into their functions and parts, we can, we can see uh, where um, the mistakes are being made. So a big mistake that I talked about a couple of weeks ago was the mistakes we make about universals. So this is from you know, British uh, 20th century philosophy example, I think, from Gilbert Ryle, who's a well-known or engineer. Um, someone comes to Oxford and says, I'm interested in enrolling, but I want to see the university first. And so they're given a tour, and they're shown the quad, they're shown um, uh, housing, they're shown the classrooms, they're shown the chapel, uh, they're shown everything, and then they come back to um, where they started with, started from, and the tour guide says, well, how did you uh, like the university? And the person says, well, I don't know, I never saw the university. <laughs> I saw the quad, I saw the you know, kitchen, I saw the dormitories. So, well, what's wrong with that, right? Nothing. Well, what's wrong with a person saying, I never saw the university? <laughs> well, in a sense, you see, we could say, um, looking at Dharma Kirti and Dhinaga, like um, uh, the tour guide should have never said, I'll show you the university, because there is no universal, the university. I can't show you the university. Um, but uh, also, the, the person taking the tour may, may have been very attached to the idea that there must be something that corresponds to that um, universal statement, the university that's above or beyond or somehow embedded in the details. He might have, but I mean, of course, this is you know, just an example. The example is, um, you know, are we aware of when we're using universals? You know, are we aware when we're not? Um, for those people that are intrepid and will be doing the readings and continue to um, progress, um, we'll find that, well, there's also a problem of just saying the quad. Well, because do you really see the quad, or do you just see pavings, right? Do you really see a kitchen, or do you just see a table, and knives and forks, you see? 
and maybe tables and knives and forks are also generalities. Do we actually see a generic image, the table, or do we just uh, do we see sense impressions that then we put together and form an image that does not exist out there in reality, but we still call it a table? Now, this could be kind of just like who cares about tables in the universities, but um, the point of talking from a Buddhist point of view is we get very much stuck on this universal called myself. <laughs> and believe that uh, you know, some identity that can consist either separate from the skandhas or the same as the skandhas or embedded in the skandhas or a collection of the skandhas these functions, but that somehow when we say myself, we're referring to some kind of entity or being that we could find. So that's why I would say if you can find the self, please bring it up and put it on the table. <laughs> it, it doesn't make that much difference uh, until we look at things practically when. Uh, we're not getting what we want, or when we get what we don't want, or when someone insults us, or we feel we're not enough, or say, I don't like myself, or people don't like me. So these very important things that impel action and emotions um, are only really referring to fictions. So in Bodhichara Vatara and in the Bodhisattva, Shantideva, has sections where I say, well, are you, are you insulting my nose? Are you insulting my heart? Are you insulting my eyes? You know, who are you insulting, right? So a uh, big part of this epistemology is to uh, analysis, which is to um, loosen things up or break them down into their operating parts and to see how is the universal or the entity we're looking for actually found among these functions or among these parts. So that's where we're going. Yes. Mine is telling me sounds all the way up and I can't hear you very well. Anybody else cannot hear? Okay, I'm not clear. Is, it, is this from our side or their side? Lama, can you hear us? He has us turned off, Lama. Okay, so Dan has got the technical. No, it's not technical. It's the right. sounds terrible. No one can make comments or ask questions. I don't, I have not heard verbally from anybody, and that's because we can't talk because he has us turned off. The overlord has have has no sound on us. You have to turn, yeah, each individual person has to, you have to assign. No, them. Connor, Connor doesn't want us to hear doesn't want us to speak. I know. Thanks, Ellen. At least somebody can hear me in the Etherlands. Lama, please talk to us. I feel so lonely. <laughs> Lama, help. OK, I'm hearing a voice crying out in the wilderness. Oh my God, why is this so difficult, Lama? I've been trying for 10 minutes now to talk to you. Connor okay. has this on mute. We're, we're not allowed to speak to, to the Lama. Okay. So uh, you're not on mute now, so are you there's off a, there's a There's a wonderful wind chiming ringing noise that, that Connor mm -hmm. says he can't do anything about. And so it's driving me absolute mm -hmm. badonkers. Well, I so, can hear now. I understand. Thank you very much. So maybe somebody else has a question or comment for the group.
So I, d I don't know how people alert that they want to give, uh, have a comment, right? Yeah, um, ask Connor. We're not hearing any of the questions because the mic's not being passed around or somebody's not turning on the mic. We can't hear you very well because of the ringing noises. I have your volume completely up on my phone. I can barely hear you, but I can hear. Who's, who's uh, like me, the llama you can't hear? Yeah, it has nothing to do with that mic ma llama. It has to do with his soundboard, his soundboard That's shit. Soundboard. Okay. Yeah. So he, is anybody he really else having, is anybody else? See, I'd like to hear from somebody else. I guess we're going to turn this into a technical thing. Uh, I can hear you. Anybody else to speak no, no, up? I can hear you. Yeah, I can hear you as well. And I can I'm, hear you. And okay. I'm good too. Yeah, okay. me too. So, uh, there is a little bit of a ringing, but it just sounds like a little weird music in the back, kind of, but it's not like terrible. That, that Gundarvas. So that's how the technology works, perhaps, is that uh, it goes a little different with each person, you think? Yeah. Yeah, so. Uh, is it a universal? <laughs> it's a universal. So uh, this is, of course, how we perceive things. Each person has a little different um, perception, do they? It could be a little bit different. Right. Right, right, right. So this is kind of like how, um, how it works, the same way when talking about, you know, perception and knowledge. So we, we have to dialogue and like, do you see it this way? Do you see it that way? How how is it? Well, you know, maybe you're like, you know, when you're doing debate or talking with someone, you're like, maybe your your drum is busted. So even though you have a mind, uh, and there is a sound, you don't hear it, right? So generally, um, when we get into Abhidharma, Sim and I are going to do a couple of courses then you'll find out you have to have at least three things present. You have to have uh, the, you know, the actual sound waves. You need the functioning base like the ear, and then you need the consciousness. Those, those three have to come together like that. So they then, and then based on our karma um, predispositions, um, like they, you know, Typically in India, they say, if you have jaundice, you'll say everything like yellow, right? So that's kind of, a, uh, the technology models are perceptual um, issues like that. But, um, as much as possible, you know, we try to uh, uh, you know, adjust to each person's kind of wavelength. So uh, it said that the Buddha, um, could simultaneously talk to different people at the same time uh, on different wavelengths so that everybody felt they were listened to. Wouldn't that be nice? <laughs> so for Kala Chakra, uh, when he was giving the uh, Kala Chakra initiation uh, teaching, at the same time he was at Vulture Peak, right? So um, not only could he talk to a group and send out different signals somehow, but it could be two places at the same time by locate. Wouldn't that be nice? Yeah. <clears throat> so, uh, you know, like just like figuring out the technology, working with someone's perceptual um, issues uh, and different karmic predispositions, uh, you know. You know, take a long time, right? So one of the, you know, this uh, debate or discussion like this, uh, one of the key factors in teaching is kind of patience. Oh, 
oh, so you don't hear it, or oh, so you don't hear it that way, or oh, you do hear it, so uh, it takes a lot of dialogue back and forth with different people, and uh, that kind of um, congruency is, is important in, in Dharma and in um, Western science too. Like, oh, and what are people having? Is anyone seeing yellow, or is everyone hearing the sound, or not hearing the sound? So that's a big important you know, part of Dharma. <clears throat> yeah, we have time for one more question and comment. Great, in the audience here. On, if Matthew Cruz takes the plunge. It is on. All right. Um, so I guess in looking at the truth of suffering and the ending of suffering or having a better life, um, this seems like we would have to really come to terms with the truth of that to have something better. But when it comes to these deeper philosophical issues, in, the, in our tradition, uh, coming to terms with the truth somehow also assists with less suffering seems really to be a very nice coincidence how it feels like it's kind of taken for granted that truth is actually the most beneficial way well um that's kind of question comments but um in Dharma, we, we want to be able to show how we think it's both the truth, but also how another position might be wrong. So you have to you know, do both for us to really overcome doubt. Because even though you know, we, we might show that uh, people do get overall more protection with the vaccine, that that isn't, doesn't necessarily show the opposite, you see, that if you don't take it, you'll be worse. So in, in doing Dharma, um, we have to spend a lot of time on, on both sides of that. Because in a way, uh, the truth is just completely obvious. <laughs> um, and we're making misperceptions all the time. So. Uh, sometimes just uh, stating the truth by itself doesn't, doesn't help. So uh, one of my Zogchen teachers, you know, just said, well, okay, uh, we'll see if just me just saying one pith instruction, you know, you become realized. So Joju <laughs> Rinpoche, he's now in Denver, goes, um, just let go. <laughs> Then said, okay, do you guys get it? Can, do I have to, can, I, can I end the talk here? So we also have to demonstrate how, you know, how we got to this knowledge too. So that can be a more difficult route, right? Um, uh, I had a friend who uh, lived at Mindsor when it first got started, who's now a PhD mathematician uh, at, at Penn State, and um, he, he um, said to, to demonstrate something wrong um, took a lot of work. And I said, well, what example? He said, well, you know, Boris Pasternak wrote um, Dr. Shivago, and Dr. Shivago was, um, you know, kind of banned for a while. And he said, what was great about Pasternak is that um, he wanted to portray Dr. Shivago as kind of a little bit of a loser. So he was able to write kind of bad poetry <laughs> for Dr. Shivago. And that takes a lot of skill to, to write just the kind of bad poetry that would show a mediocre poet, right? So um, same way in, in Tai Chi, like, Robert Nakashima says, well, I also want you to know how to do it wrong, see, like both sides. So when, uh, then, then there's real certainty. So it isn't just acceptance 
authority or acceptance um, just because it seems like that's the way out to actually know those ways. Is that helpful? Or? Yeah, I mean, that's helpful. I feel like I have kind of a, like a fetish around truth and reality. Yeah. That's why I'm here. Um, but I still sometimes wonder if it, for everyone that's actually uh, the best for them. It leads to the, the greatest amount of well-being for them. Okay, I'm not clear. You're saying you have doubts or something? Or? Um, not for myself, but I can speak for others. Okay, well, I'm, I'm not sure, but you know, when we're talking about truth, like just on a very basic level, which is why it's important to talk sometimes to ordinary realities, it's true that in the United States, we agree to drive on the right hand side of the road. So if you just, if you don't, then you're going to have a head on. So it's like that. So it does make a huge difference. So uh, all Dharma is practical. So it, you know, it makes a huge difference that uh, you know, we not only know some things about health, but we actually abide by some agreements, right? And um, that's, you know, of course, uh, a big part of Buddhist epistemology is that um, our workaday world is based on agreements, not on inherent existence. So it does make a big difference. So when we're talking about truths, it does it makes a huge difference. I don't know if that's helpful. I think I think what I'm hearing also is that if those truths that we're agreeing on are um, met with philosophical certainties that can be verified and the most amount of agreement can occur. Yeah, I mean, it, 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 it helps if um, we establish that to not accept this truth would be, uh, you know, absurd, right? Absurd means like even people who disagreed with it wouldn't accept, you know, like that. So, uh, so not just that it's unhealthy or but, um, that it's impossible to accept certain untruths because even people who are arguing against you wouldn't want to accept them. Yeah. It's just like you said, people know to drive on the right side of the road. It doesn't mean everybody drives on the right side of the road. We have collisions every day, right? So that's a perfect example of what you're saying. There's going to be harm from knowing the truth. They're still going to choose to drive on the wrong. Yeah. Yeah. So um, there, there was um, practical and um, felt um, experiences there's always suffering from uh, non truth so if if a truth or a non truth has no function, then we're kind of like the twentieth century logical positivists we're not real interested in it you know? it's not you know, if, it, if it doesn't you know, correct something that's actually kind of practical we're not super interested in it so. That's why the Buddha said, well, I didn't, I don't, I'm not interested in the universe as finite or infinite because that doesn't really make a difference as far as one's liberation or something is concerned. Cool. <laughs> so I, I hope everyone can still hear a little bit, right? And get something. Thank you. And thumbs up help. Yeah, like that. Um, I think, you know, uh, uh, I think it's hard because of Zoom, like, if, if everybody's mic was on at the same time, what would happen? Would it be chaos? I mean, here, everyone, 
you know, here everyone could be kind of talking at the same time and then you go, oh, okay, could you be quiet, I'll talk, but you can't hear each other on video land, right? No? If everybody had an, an earpiece, yes, we could all be on our microphones at the same time, but you're going to hear coughing, you're going to hear breathing, you're going to hear snoring, you're going to hear trains, you're going to hear Right, so right, right. This can't go on for... No, no, no. But I think, possible. but everyone could have their mic on when we're singing. No, that would be chaotic because then, the be people, then we're going to run into time delays, right? So people are going right, to be hearing right, themselves right. and then that's going to be yeah. right. right. So there, there are um, limitations uh, because of the technology a little bit. So we have to accept that, you know. At least here, when we're here, we can sing together, right? Um, it creates a very kind of harmonious thing. That's the nice thing about opera, is that if you're singing opera, like particularly Mozart opera, you can be singing because uh, you're having different notes. You can be having two people singing at the same time, right? And uh, it makes sense. You know, so that's why um, one of my therapy Supervisors a long time ago said the correct way for couples to speak to each other is to sing. <laughs> I'm so mad at you. You didn't show up on time. Yes, I know you are. Wouldn't that be sweet? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So uh, that that I would like. So for everyone in Dona Darge, uh, when you, you want to come to the Lama as administrator. Administrator means you're coming to file a complaint, right? You're not coming for teachings, you want to complain. Then uh, you guys should sing it. <laughs> you know? Yeah, K Sarasara. Or, you know, maybe. You know, maybe it could be Don Giovanni for the guys, and somebody else could be Katerina. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. Like that. So, you know, I appreciate uh, so the technology problems have demonstrated how we have to dialogue and listen and then work with feedback and uh, you know, get information about how the system actually works. Because I, I don't. I still don't know exactly how the technology of Zoom and microphones work. But I find that when you are patient and explain it to people, you know, then usually people calm down a little bit. If they feel they're being heard and you kind of go, okay, this is why we have to fill out the paperwork and you know, this is how we have to do the technology. And, you know, and then, we feel when we feel we're not being listened to, but we get angry that way. Okay. So, um, Sabrina has to be on the phone all the time. Kaiser nerves, and people are really pissed at Kaiser. So, she has to go. What you're saying is very important, <laughs> and I'm listening. <laughs> and I do need you to read. Uh, your medications and the dosage from your bottle. So then there's like 40 meds to go through. Because <laughs> who has a sheet of their meds, right? No doctor gives the sheet of the meds. They should, right? You should go and they should just say, you know, you should get a little printout and here's all the meds. And do they do that? I, Kaiser doesn't do that. And it's, yeah, I know. So. And you know, they take time to explain, like, oh, okay. and this is how the technology works. And then with our perception and our um, sense of self, like how it works, it's going to be break it down. So, last, last minute, anything? Can I ask you a question? Yeah, go for it. 
Uh, so I just wanted to know exactly what the four noble truths are. I think they have to do with suffering. All have to do with suffering, correct? In a sense, yes. Okay. So first, the, tr or the truth of suffering and the truth of the cause of suffering and the truth at the end of suffering and the path, the marga that leads to the end of suffering. So the Buddha said, many times, all I teach is suffering in the end of suffering. I just teach suffering in the end of suffering. So I like to think of suffering um, as uh, you know, anguish. You know? So really heart-wrenching. It isn't just that things are drag, or things are frustrating, or it's a bummer, but there are things that are really horrific anguish. So unless we bring it to that kind of level, it, it doesn't seem, then we're having coping skills for working with something that we think is both kind of a drag or it's stressful, right? So if there's real anguish, then, then you know, we, we want to really address that. Of course, oh, one of the times where somebody had of anguish, which is documented in a number of different sutras. Is one time, uh, you know, a woman you know, came and you know, was giving a talk, and she was holding a baby who had died, right? You know, so uh, he just didn't have a dialogue with her. You know, he said, well, okay, so that's anguish, right? She she had to go around and talk to all the families where there had never been a death, right? So interesting kind of skillful means, you know, to create a, 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 her own bereavement group, right? Like that. But that's anguish, you know, it isn't just a drag. It's horrific, right? That's the meaning of dukkha. It's intolerable. You know, dukkha suffering here means it's intolerable. So some go, no, it's, it's, it's really not okay, you know, no, child abuse is not okay. Is it ever okay? Have you ever think like, well, that's okay, that's sort of greater, but no, that's never okay. So that's, that's real suffering. Yeah, George is writing away, so we must have a paper due tomorrow morning at five in the morning. Are you a note taker? Yes, I am. <laughs> That's good. People yeah, that take notes, notes actually, you know, they, they yeah. But in the monastery, you can't take notes. Okay. You're not allowed to take notes. You just have to remember. But it isn't just that. So, what if there were no notes? And there's no recording, and you guys just said, well, "This is the teaching, and we've got to share it between each other. We have to actually get along." or you won't get out of, off the island, right? So that is it, right? <laughs> okay, all right. Lama, Thank can I make one question. comment? Yes, hello. Yeah, I just wanted to invite everyone to the Wednesday night beginner shamatha meditation. Um, we have it on Zoom and um, yeah, we'll just be doing some basic meditation. So I just wanted to invite people. Yeah, thank you. That's a good pitch. Perfect. I am gone for the next two weeks. Um, and I'll be back in November. I'll miss you all. Um, so I plan on coming back revived extra time to breathe ocean air and meditate like that. So that's busy. Yes, you can party. Yeah, go. Yeah. Yeah, correct. I want it to send me the video. Right. Okay. All right, let's do closing.
due to the merits of these virtuous actions, may I quickly attain the state of a guru Buddha and meet all living beings without exception and without a mind state. If it's a supreme jewel of Bodhicitta that has not arisen or a rising girl, may that which has arisen not diminish but increase more and more. In the land of the circle by stone mountains, you are the source of all happiness and good. All powerful Chenrezi, Tenzin Hatsu, please remain until Samsara ends. May the teachings of the Buddha flourish, and may the upholders of the teachings remain forever. May all migrators achieve happiness, and may they fulfill all their temporary and ultimate goals. Those saw the magical display of the deep awareness of all the victorious ones, principal giver of a stream of profound and vast instructions to the fortunate migrators, please remain always unperishing, unchanging, and fading. Avalokiteshvara, great protector of objects of compassion, Manjushri, master of all this wisdom, Ajapani, destroyer of the entire host of ours, Sankhapa, crown jewels of the land and cities, Osangjakpa, I make the best. Yeah, this is good. Yeah. Thank you, everybody, for contributing. And thank you, everybody, for having helped maintain uh, Dona Darge, um, uh, you know, creating a very auspicious uh, situation so John and Mishay can come here first week in December and give uh, Kala Chakra initiation. So uh, we'll have the details of that hopefully before too long, but we definitely want to save dates between like, December 2nd and 5th to be in town, right? Like that. <laughs> Perfect. Okay. Bye, everybody. It's been great. This is fun. <laughs> Thanks, George. Good question. Ciao. Uh, thank you, Lama. Bye, Karen. Bye, Ashley. See you soon. Bye, Lama. Bye, thank you, Lama. Yeah, bye, Morris. Bye, Dana. Bye, thank you. Thanks, Lama. Bye, Lama. Thank you. Bye, thank you, Lama. Yeah, good. They're all there. Super. <laughs> I like that gradual fade. <laughs>